Hello everyone, this is Professor Todd Giles and we're continuing with the early Renaissance. This time we're down in Italy and some of the hallmarks to look for is the artwork that is again trying to emulate classical Greek and Roman art and architecture. Um, it's sort of like Romanesque except on steroids. They really are exploring and working with those themes and details of the classical artists. Um, and they live in a society there in Italy where they can see the remnants of the Roman Empire in their buildings and sculpture and um, paintings. So they can see it and they know what it used to be like and now how can we get back there? So they're trying to get back to detail and realism um, but one thing that you need to understand is Italy is still very much Catholic. And as long as you understand this um, battle between the Northern European, um, which some parts are going with the Reformation, and there's a freedom in the art, but down in Italy it's still very Catholic. Um, and there's these two battling sides there and styles of artwork and the themes are different. Okay, what we see here is very, very, very Catholic. Okay, um, first thing to see here is understanding a little bit of a map. Um, horrible map, sorry it's pixelated. Here's Rome. Florence is up here. Here's Pisa, which we've already seen stuff from. Milan in the north, which is more Germanic and French, we might say, and Venice is up here. So um, let's look at Florence. Uh, many times Florence is known as the, uh, the birthplace of the Renaissance. If you look at the timeline, the Northern Europeans were really working on artwork that was so much better before the Italians really got there. Um, but here's an overview of Florence, the tile roofs that are very, very um, Italian. You notice this huge building here. This is uh, Santa Maria del Fiore. It's a cathedral with this huge dome. And this is the whole building itself is called the Duomo. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with a dome, but D-U-O-M-O, -O, Duomo. But it's this building. Okay. Now here's the cathedral as it looked for over a hundred years. It's Romanesque and the city fathers wanted the largest church in the world and this was the largest church in the world at that time. Even old St. Peter's in Rome was not this large. But the problem was they didn't know how to create the dome. So it was open to the weather for decade after decade after decade. This is what the front looks like. The three doors, the portals, the facade. Here's the floor plan. Notice the cross design. Here is where the dome sits. And we have three apses with chapels within each one. Okay, um, it is very much in a cathedral style of the basilica style. Nave, aisle, aisle, transept. Okay, but again, they have that freedom to use those elements to create something new. Okay, here is looking down the interior. This is the nave area. Aisles on that side, aisle on that side, and then the rotunda, the dome is here but then we can see the back apse area with different chapels in between and the altar area with a cross. So it's somewhat of a plain church on the inside, a plain cathedral, but it still has elements of the great cathedrals of the time, even the Gothic cathedrals. This is very Romanesque, but it does have pointed arches. Um, so it's sort of a conglomeration of the two. So now let's look at a certain artist. Let's put this information back a little bit. Let's talk about Ghiberti. 
He's a goldsmith, but really he knows how to do all kinds of different things. He he's really is a great artist. Um, okay, so we need to talk about this door. Um, it's a door to the baptistry. This is the baptistry to the cathedral in Florence, and the cathedral would have been right here, just steps away. I just don't have a picture of it here exactly right now. Um, but this is by the artist Andrea Pisano. Uh, he's from Pisa. And in the 1300s, he created this bronze door. And they loved it. It was great. But then the guild that controlled the, the artwork for the cathedral decided they needed a new door. So they had a competition. And the competition, the two finalists were Ghiberti and Brunelleschi. Some people would say Brunelleschi. And the book goes into it a little bit here. I want you to look at this and what's the difference? You know, in short, I mean, we could go into detail and, and normally in the classroom, I do go into a lot more detail, but here um, we don't have the time but really, which is better? Which do you think is better? Which one would you select? This has a lot of energy by Brunelleschi. Okay, um, look at that hand holding the head of Isaac. His hand is around his neck and his thumb is underneath his chin to expose his neck. The angel is flying in from the side. Um, there's a foreground, there's a middle ground, there's a background. Um, so there's a lot going on here, but it's all about action and angles. But then look at Ghiberti, he does something different. To something that could be very violent, he quiets everything down. We've got a left and a right. Here are the um, servants and the donkey. There's the center line, and then there's Abraham and Isaac and the angel on the other side. Okay, so it's more of a symmetrical left and right. And look at the poses here. This looks more like one of the statues from ancient Greek statuary. Look at the pose here on Abraham. That's contraposto. So he is looking at elements of ancient classical Greek and Roman sculpture to bring forward to his day. So he is selected. So I want you to think of this. He's the winner. Brunelleschi is the loser. So every time you think of Brunelleschi, you think loser. Okay? Do the little L on the forehead. Loser. That's who he is. Okay? Um, a little better look there. Now, so Ghiberti is given the ability to create, he's hired to create the doors, and this is what he creates. If you go back and look at the other door, it's exactly the same design, except for the interior of this diamond and circle design. It's very Gothic. It is not forward thinking, it's very Gothic. And look at the dates. It takes them 24 years to create these doors. Now he's doing other things along the way and he's experimenting with bronze, but that's it, okay? And by the way, and I think the book talks about it, this is the, really people say this is the start of the Renaissance. By Ghiberti looking back at the classical sculpture and bringing it forward it's a rebirth, which Renaissance means it's the rebirth of that artwork. So this door goes in right here. And he gets done with it. And what do they do after 24 years? They say, you know what? We like it. We want another set. And that's where Ghiberti comes in and says, all right, but I get to design it how I want to design it. And he comes up with this. And I really wish I had a better view of this. Go online and you can find uh, on YouTube some wonderful videos showing it. 
And now this is the door that now faces to the east. Um, it's solid bronze, covered in gold here. And instead of having 20 some images, now it's only 10 images. And within each one of those images is a multiple story. And I showed you this in the very first lecture where there's all kinds of things going on, but really it is an innovation trying to bring uh, that old artwork forward. Okay, so Ghiberti goes on, and what is he looking at? Okay, what are we doing with the Renaissance? We're looking at these old sculptures that are around, and here's What's going on in the Gothic period, where this is not realistic. Okay, that's getting a little bit more. But then we see artists are coming up with these type of pieces of artwork, where the hip is put out. All the weight is on one leg. The hip is put out. The weight is on this leg. They're looking down. They're looking over. They're turning their head, which is very different. Okay. So this is really that, that essence of the Renaissance. Okay? These pieces were done by an artist named Donatello. He's one of the Ninja Turtles, yes. He also came up with this. Um, this is the Magdalene, um, where she's, her clothing is her hair. Okay? And she's praying here. And the texture, this is wood sculpture. But it's all about texture, the rough hair, the smooth skin, even her face is very rough. But it's trying to get you to feel for her and how much she is repentant for her sins and thankful to have Christ. Now, we could talk a long time here, and I won't, about the David by Donatello. Uh, the book does a pretty good job talking about it. This is really the very first nude sculpture, full-size nude sculpture in Western art since the collapse of the Roman Empire. Now, this is not supposed to be public art. This is not in the public square. This is to be housed in the Medici gardens, um, away from the public. Um, this causes great angst with some people, um, but it is a great piece of artwork because it is such a step ahead and it is such a nod back to the artwork of the Romans and the Greeks. Okay, and now on the super quick, let's go back here to the Santa Maria del Fiore Cathedral. Here it is without the dome and here it is with the dome. So what happened, well, Notice it's by Brunelleschi. Where's he been? He has been in Rome and other sites around Italy measuring and surveying the ancient Roman structures, including the Pantheon. So he's looking at the Pantheon's dome, trying to figure out how did they create a dome that spans that distance. So what he comes up with is a combination between an arch with the point, because he knows the Gothic cathedrals can go higher and higher with that pointed arch. And he comes up with this thing that's a pointed arch, but it has an inside arch and an outside arch. And it's made of brick and it's made of stone and all kinds of, uh, there's a great book out there called uh, Brunelleschi's Dome. And if you're interested in this, go get it. Because it explains in detail, but it's very readable how this dome was created. So he creates this great dome um, using timbers, using brick. Here's an image of all the bricks as they're leading up to it interior today. But really this dome is important because it leads up to all the great domes that we have in the world today that are all in this design style versus a circle like the Pantheon. Okay, they all have a little bit of a point on them, including our capital in Washington, D.C. 